Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the folks who are building a better future. Today, we've got somebody who's doing that with an epic tech twist. Keith Kirkland on the program. Keith, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So Keith, haptics, talk to me. Yeah, so haptics means of or relating to the sense of touch. And so um, it's something that we're all deeply familiar with, but not a lot of people actually know what it's really called and what it's really about. And if you look at kind of like the way optics is for eyes or, you know, of course, audio, like basically what you're doing is trying to figure out how to communicate information like directly into the skin. Um, that information could be something as simple as a cell phone notification that someone is texting you, or it can be as complex as force feedback from a robo operated surgery um, procedure. Um, so the idea is, is that like there's all this information that we collect through our skin, but design wise, there's not really a lot that we've done with it so far. Um, if you look at, you know, of course this, there are contextual components to it, but you know, a human can kind of tell the difference between love or aggression in an instant, like through touch. Um, of course, you have context, you have histories, and you know, but just kind of divorcing all of that for a second, like the physical act of touch can communicate such a rich experience. But all we've really done with it, like at mass, is like video game controllers, you know. And so now we're trying to see, like, okay, like what is really in this space, and like what happens when we empower. Uh, an entire industry of designers the same way we did with graphics, you know, like um, to design for touch. And so that's kind of like the place that we're starting from is like the skin is like our canvas, essentially. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I was listening to a podcast and they were essentially trying to code in different senses. So you wear a little vest, different areas get activated and that essentially teaches you over time through feedback. Mm -hmm. new, completely new sense paradigms, which is kind of what you guys are doing. You're giving sight to the blind, so to speak. Yes. What's the story? So the, you want the whole story or you want like the now story? <laughs> well, what, what's the good stuff? How'd you get into this? Um, so, uh, so I and two of my co-founders, we kind of came together. Um, right after we graduated, we were all in Pratt and industrial design. Um, my co-founder, Young, and I, we were in the master's program together and we were classmates. My co-founder, Kevin, did the undergrad program there and him and Young had worked on a joint thesis together. And so we all walked into this company through different doors to this idea of haptics. Um, uh, my co-founder, Kevin, for example, was working with a guy who uh, basically was making these new vibration motors that would allow you to pan vibration from one hand to the other that gave you the physical experience of like, a vibrating ball moving in between your hands, but there were not, but there was nothing. Um, and so he started working with him. I had met him and I saw like what was possible with these kind of devices. And so that, that got me really excited about it. Um, but ultimately I ended up spending my year at Pratt or my last year at Pratt uh, developing my thesis, which was uh, a thesis centered around movement. I was basically trying to build a suit that would allow a person to download Kung Fu and then the suit would teach it to them using vibrations. So that's how we all walked through the door. Um, and then afterwards, when we all connected together, we were like, hey, we've all been doing, have this interest in haptics, we should do something together. And when we thought about what we were gonna do, uh, it really came from a space of um, the challenge that my thesis had presented was all the technology was there to do all this stuff now. And the reason why it wasn't really done was because the, there wasn't like a language to try to communicate information through touch with. And so initially we were thinking like, maybe there's some universal language that underlines like the sense of touch that we can use to communicate stuff. Um, quickly found out that that's not exactly true, um, but there are like contextual things that we can draw from um, that people might have experiences that we can translate into touch-based experiences that give like an intuitive reaction. And so ultimately what we were doing is the, the Kung Fu suit was just way too complicated, right? It was. Uh, to figure out a whole new language using touch to get like accuracy in four dimensional space with millimeter precision with millisecond timing wirelessly over multiple nodes that have to communicate multiple types of information like it was it was a monster to tackle all at once and so what we did is we kind of scaled it back and was like okay what about navigation like navigation instead of like lots of joints you're one point instead of four-dimensional space is three-dimensional space like two dimensions plus time 
like GPS resolution at its best is like three to five meters. Um, so we didn't have the challenges around resolution. Um, and even if our system was a second or two behind, it really didn't matter because it takes you time to cover geographical distances. And more than anything, the commands were really, really simple. You go straight, you turn left, you turn right, wrong way, you've arrived. And so we felt that like we had enough of a, like a powerful enough use case, but a simple enough use case to really refine what this language that we wanted to explore would look like. And so navigation was our exploration into the space of communicating information through touch, navigation in particular. Um, but then we knew that like if we could figure it out for navigation, we could then take that and expand it to other areas like martial arts training or physical rehabilitation or you know, a million other industries we can think of. Isn't every process where you try to train someone on haptics kind of like a, a learning process, an onboarding process, regardless of what you're teaching them? Is yeah. there because of the universal language deal? Yeah, you know, like, so there, there is an onboarding process. Um, and so that was the biggest challenge. You know, like a lot of, a lot of the experiences uh, that are being done haptically now, they, they take some type of relatively arbitrary meaning or predefined meaning uh, of a haptic signal. And then you pair that with some thing that you want to communicate, like turn left. Du -du 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 turn left. Over and over, your brain will eventually come to understand intuitively, you know, like that when you feel this, that a left turn is coming up. But that usually takes time for learning. And one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure that like someone who opened the box, has never tried the thing on, doesn't know anything about it, can put it on, and can figure out which way is the right way to go. And so in our exploration of a haptic language, we kind of broke it down into two major subsections. And one was this idea of like these haptic expressions, which buzz, 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 means turn left, right? And we find a lot of value in those types of expressions because you can communicate really rich, nuanced information. Um, but because of the horrible learning curve, we also built what we're calling haptic gestures. Um, and haptic gestures are kind of like a kiss or like a punch in the face. It's kind of like instinctively you understand that something happened. Now, you might not know why it happened, but you get it instantaneously. And so we built this effect that we call the haptic corridor. And haptic corridor basically is a way to keep a blind person walking down a straight path is basically they feel the edges of the wall as they walk. And so they know how to stay into center because they can feel the edges of the walls on each side. And so we've tried that on over a thousand people and 85% of people can figure it out within about 10 seconds. And all I do is say, hey, do a 360 spin really slowly. Now stop, hey, do a 360 spin again and stop in a direction that you think the device is telling you is the right way to go. And so we're leveraging on like kind of like these intuitive haptic experiences. Like most people felt walking toward open space just felt the most natural. And so we built the device in a way that like you walk towards open space. And now most people with no instructions or prior experience can figure it out pretty easily. And then you can layer the haptic expressions, which are more nuanced and rich over time as a person uses the device and learns more. And you know, those things are introduced. So it's super duper complicated to teach a language or new form of communicating. Um, but what we're hoping to do is by tapping into things like, you know, we've, most of us have been in a car and had that car stop suddenly. So we're like, okay, if I want to make you stop, I can communicate buzz, 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 buzz. And you'll learn that that means stop over time. Or I can just, hello. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, okay, sorry, I said my internet connection was uh, messing up. Um, so I can give you buzz, 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 and it, you'll learn that that means stop over time. Or um, if I gave, if I was able to design that jerk that we all felt when we had to stop suddenly, you'd probably feel it and just like pause, even if you had no idea what it was. So we're trying to figure out like, what are these contextual things that we can pull out of our human experience and how can we like then like distill that into a haptic experience so we can leverage the, the, the learning and the, the, the heritage, I guess, of, of, of that motion 
like has to a person and, and apply it in a new way. It's like the one year old that picks up the smartphone and is able to figure it out instantly. It's exactly. just intuitive. Exactly. Where are we in terms of the state of the haptics industry right now? I feel like we're really getting started and that there's been some promise, but not a lot of progress. Yeah. You know, I mean, haptics isn't a new industry and it's, it's like, it's been around for like, you know, half a century at this point. Um, but I think that like stuff on the consumer side in particular is really starting. Like, I feel like when we first walked into the space about four years ago, it seemed pretty barren. Like now we're starting to see and recognize that like, you know, uh, people are putting a lot of work into the haptic space. And, you know, a huge part of that is driven by like the gaming and the VR community, of course, um, because you have, you know, like 5K fully immersive, you know, visuals, you know, you have like 360 degree audio. I can tell that the box dropped over my right shoulder, you know, like, but when I go and try to pick that box up, I'm completely divorced from the experience, you know? And so the touch part is, it's so necessary that it was only a matter of time before like someone started to develop it. Um, and the gaming community has, and the VR community has a very, very strong reason to develop a lot of these technologies. So Microsoft, you know, uh, Facebook, um, they're all doing stuff around like exploring with this kind of like haptics and like what's possible in a space. Um, but on the consumer end, I think that we're really just seeing what the possibilities are. And it's, it's like all the, it's like some of the players have like lined up and like the race is about to start. And I'm super curious to kind of see like where it's all going to go now that, you know, it, the, on the, con, on the public facing side, it has a lot more like visibility. What is the future? Is it VR? Is it some type of consumer regular world use? Is it commercial applications? Where do you see the big success happening for haptics if it does? Yeah, you know, I, I think that like, I think the consumer market right now, I think it is going to be probably in the VR and the gaming industry. And it's, there's also a lot of space in like, uh, in medical, like telepresence, telesurgeries, um, giving doctors more kind of feedback while they're doing like robotic assist surgeries or even like surgeries from other parts of the world using robotics, right? And so these are kind of like real world applications now that are the Da Vinci, for example, is a robotic assist surgery device um, that are already kind of being employed. Um, and so I do think that medical and VR are going to be a super duper huge part of, of haptics for like the next like, you know, like, two to eight years probably but i think what's going to happen after that is in the same way where wearable technology used to be like put lights in your hoodie you know like and then all of a sudden it was like you know like with google and like levi's did it was like turn your jacket into an input interface you know like we we we, we we've done that in like less than like 10 years you know what i'm saying like from this kind of introduction lightly of like wearable technology so you know, like it's, it's come a long way. Like you always start with the obvious. And then after the obvious is done, like you have room to think like what could be next. And I think that what we're really going to be moving into, that's going to be really interesting. And it's kind of one of the reasons we didn't necessarily start in the VR in the gaming space is because we already saw like the next step. And really what we see haptics as is the ability to like expand the human ability to sense its environment. Um, and so like right now, it's like we all have five senses because biologically that's what we were built with. But like, what if you could feel Wi-Fi, right? Or ultraviolet light or a huge number of anything, like anything that we can record, that we can analyze, that we can sense, we can figure out a way to turn that information into haptics so that your ears and eyes stay free to focus on what you're doing, but almost like a heads up display, but without the distraction. You know, like, and so we see kind of like haptics as like the next frontier of like communication. Like, and I think that like, like my dream would literally be to see someone have a haptic design, like college program where you can go in the same way you study like audio engineering and the same way you study graphic design or UX UI design, like you study haptics, like human perception of touch and like haptic illusions and like. You know, like, so I, I think that that's where we're going to end up going to, where haptics becomes like its own field with its own source of like designers and education around that. Um, but right now, I think that most of the gateway into haptics is, a, is, is personal. It's 
you know, like there are a few haptic programs out there. Adult industry. I imagine that's driving <laughs> a big, that's gotta be what, come on, it's sex robots. That's what's, <laughs> that's what's driving a big part of the haptic uptick and the research. They're going to be the ones who push out the big innovations initially. Exactly. You know, and, and honestly, it's like, that is, that is totally true. Usually, usually that line is like video game controllers and sex toys. You know what I'm saying? Like I edit it out <laughs> depending on what I'm talking to. For the, <laughs> for, for the same crowd, right? Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> what do you what do you think about that? So I've I've seen stuff in in pretty reputable places of certain robotic things being deployed in different cafes, et cetera, around the world. Does yeah. that scare you at all as we move towards this robotic human mixed future? I mean, you know, like it's 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 interesting. It's like uh, you know, like uh, I lived in Japan for about six months, and you know, like uh, so this idea of like robots interacting with society you know what i'm saying it's kind of like almost like being there it, it's it's like drilled into the culture almost a bit in a way it's just like there's plenty of outlets and there's plenty of space for these niche type experiences and i don't think that necessarily scares me um i do feel that like you know like at the end of the day like very few things replaces a genuine human connection but that's only because right now that robots are nowhere close to what humans are as far as like emoting and sensitivity and understanding. Like the minute that line is blurred, I don't really think there'll be a difference, you know? Like, and so like super, super future, you know, I think it's kind of like, you know, like in the same way that, you know, I don't know, like we can augment ourselves now with better running shoes. I, I do see that at, at some point there, is going to be a space where it's like, hey, actually, if I just had that robotic hand instead of my real one, you know, it would be like 20 times better for what it is that is important to me, you know? And so I, I guess I see a future where like all that's probably going to be like very, very possible. And, and it's, all, it's also going to be very, it's going to be very interesting to see like what we do around like the conservation of like humanity versus this new exploration. But I do think that, um, that they both have space to, to, to coexist. I don't, I don't think that like the rise of sex robots means like the end of real human connection. And I don't think that real human connection like is, uh, is going to be, uh, I don't think real human connection is, covers all the bases of like ways we could possibly connect, right? It's a, we are, we're limited as being, so our connection and our communication is, naturally limited as well and so like what happens when you take the gates off of that and you give space for people to really explore in their own way i'm i have no idea but it doesn't scare me it, it it's it's uh it's, it's interesting to see where it's all going to go what scares me a little bit is when we do have robots how will we tell if they're conscious or not <laughs> and if they are conscious is it slavery and if they're not conscious do we think they are and if we think they are what are the implications it just it creates like a real bad wormhole, rabbit hole, where there's not really an answer anywhere. You kind of just dive deeper and deeper into the, oh, shit. Yeah. I mean, but, but you know what? Like, it, and, and, and Shinto is like a, the idea behind Shinto, which is a, you know, a religion practice in Japan, is, is that like all objects have souls. So I think that like, I think the thing that concerns me is that like the way we're like, even like if you, if you imagine Siri as like, one large like machine learning program essentially which is basically is what it is it's like it's learning from all of us and like you know like finding new way and better ways to do things right and so a maybe lot of people not, maybe not siri siri is pretty slow but the yeah, other yeah. yeah yeah exactly you know like and so like but like whatever it is it's like like the way people talk to their robots is like shut up siri you know like the the aggression is like like that's going to get built into the models like when when I saw like when they had the Toyota robot, it was like, look at the Toyota robot. You can push it down and it can get back up on its own. It was like people like poking it with sticks. And I was just like, this is, this is going to be like the video that the robots play when like, you know, <laughs> it was like, this is why we destroyed humanity because like you guys have been picking on us from the very beginning. So I think that the, the more important thing is to like, is to make sure that like, uh, um, that the, when we're interacting with machines, that like we give them as good of a data set as possible. <laughs> to respond with and respond to and to learn from and and right now i don't think we're i don't think we're doing that that's that's a i don't know what i don't know what siri is learning from everybody else i talked to siri really nicely she's like we're friends you know <laughs> 
But would that mean that we can't have robot laborers because it's slavery? I don't think so. I mean, you know, like I think personally, it's like, uh, like my whole my whole view on it is that like, like I am a, you know, like worker to my company, right? You know, like you're running a startup. It doesn't pay you anything, you know, like you have a vision and a dream, but you feel like you have a purpose. You feel like you were built to do something. And for you, that purpose is significant and important enough that you're willing to take no pay. You're willing to like risk everything that you have when you could rock a safer route because this outcome just seems more designed for you, you know? And so for me, I think that like, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, like, you know, like, robot slavery I, I mean it, it could be potentially it depends on like if the robots are interested in doing the work once they become conscious um but i think also too is that like uh at some point like you know money is going to be a thing of the past potentially as well and so i'm wondering like what happens when we get to a point where in society because it's like at, at some point the robots are going to be able to do everything and no one's going to be able to work how are we going to deal with society if no one can earn an income, right? And that's going to concentrate wealth into like a very, very small few who own all the robots and everyone else is going to be left with nothing. And so it's like, I think that like, there are going to be programs that are going to air and be put into place that are going to make living and pursuing your passion, knowing that that passion is a contribution to society as more significant than earning money, which is kind of like, I mean, we're capitalists. That's, that's kind of like what we do. You know, like, but I think that we're going to shift. I don't know. I'm not, I have no idea when, but. We, we have to, or we're screwed. We have to, or we're screwed. Exactly. <laughs> Which is why I argue Europe's actually in a much better position, because they're at least willing to help people. Mm -hmm. we, we, we're not a big fan of, of money without work here. Yeah, but, exactly. And that mind shift definitely needs to shift like a whole lot. That mind shift, mindset needs to shift a whole lot. So you build a hardware product. That's, that's pretty darn hard. You build a lot of software with it. That doesn't make it easier. Yeah. And then you, I got to actually build it into a business. What's that like doing like the hardest thing possible and then also having to teach people about it? Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> um, you know, like I, I, I think like one of the things that we really try to do is that being a creator or something like you can see so far out you're like oh man like ubiquitous hack devices like it makes total sense like and like for us that like that's what the future really looks like but we we also understand that like for most people like they don't know what the word haptic means they never heard the word before so it's like you have to do some fill-in to like to help people who can't necessarily see where the end of this road can go like to see how far the road stretches and i think that like you know it's 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 a it's a it's it's a responsibility for people who have the vision to find ways to communicate that vision to people who don't have it because that's the way all of humanity moves forward is that visions get communicated to people who can then break them down and execute on them and so for us I guess like the the way we the way we deal with it is uh, it's through the use case you know like we could talk all day about haptics and the technology but like no one cares really you know i mean i care we care the haptics people we care but the users they just want to do something in a better way and so when you can hey here's the haptics but the haptics are really just like the background operating system here's what you can do like we're going to help blind people run marathons like that's when people start like oh they find the story they see the use case and then from that, they can jump into a world where it's like, but wait, like I should be using this to kayak with. And we're like, yeah, you totally should, you know? And so we try to, we, we try to grab onto, um, and not that we try, cause it's not like it's been like an intentional thing. It's, it's, it's really just worked out where it's like, we've met really awesome people. They presented wonderful ideas to us. And then we've tried to incorporate those ideas and they're listening and their support and their help. And then like wonderful things come out. And so, um, in our case with the marathon, for example, like, you know, like we never planned on trying to help a blind person run a New York City marathon. That was never our intention. It was Simon reached out to us, who's our marathon runner from the UK. He saw our technology in an article and was like, hey, I ran a marathon using some audio technology. And it was like, it drove me crazy. Like, can, can you build this so I can run a marathon this year with it? We're like, no, but sure, let's do it. You know, like, and so 
I think that like when you find really powerful use cases for your technology, because you know, like I don't know that 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 whole thing is kind of like you you don't you don't want to drill, you want a hole. You know, like if, when you find a use case for your technology that makes a lot of sense then it's really easy for people to buy into that story and to find their own ways to kind of jump from that and to build their own futures. Open source? Could you open source something like this and train devs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, open source is always a possibility. Like, the, 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 the thing is, is, like, the, the thing you play with around open source is, like, total access, total freedom, which is super great for, like, you know, forwarding, like, technology and forwarding the culture. But then also, too, a lot of times um, you can end up and, and, you know, this is, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get like some like horrible emails from the open source community, but like you can get like really hard to control, like for like quality and, and things like that. And so we're kind of like figuring out this line of like what makes sense for us, you know, like right now our, our platform is built on open street maps, which is like an open source street map. And so we definitely believe in open. Um, and then we also have some technologies that we've developed that we don't necessarily plan to commercialize, but they're kind of cool. So we're like, hey, we're not going to like run a company or try to run a product model off of these. Like, let's just put these builds out and give them away um, so that anyone can build them and use them. And if they want one built, we can build one for them. Um, so we do believe in like both open source and kind of like the closed environment, like kind of managing them both in a way to, that makes the most sense for whatever the company is. Could you do it like an app store? You sell your product and then you have different people creating applications. You vet them and then people pay either like a monthly thing or they pay to get whatever access it would be. They want to have a Wi-Fi sensor that they can experience. They want to um, have a pleasure stimulator for wherever they may use that for or something along those lines. Yeah. Um, and so like ultimately what we really see is like uh, we do see like haptic Haptics is a platform. And right now, the biggest challenge with haptics is, is that you have to understand hardware enough to build it yourself, which is pretty hard, you know, like, and so it's like, uh, the thing that we really see is that we always, our, our, our vision was, and I think it always will be, is that like, haptics should be put into the hands of the people to be used as a tool to design with. Um, and so like the way band for us, like, and, and that's what our, our initial thoughts were like, let's build a haptic device that allows people to build their own haptic experiences into it. And then we realized like we would give this away and like outside of like, you know, game developers or like haptic experts and like maybe some like hobbyists and DIYers who like really had a, a deep understanding or a deep curiosity, no one would know what to do with this thing. And so we were like, you know what, like let's build our own first example. Like, let's build the Wayband. Let's show a use case for the device that we built ourselves because, like, we, we're the best stewards to bring in what we feel this vision of haptics is because, you know, we're creating it for ourselves. And so it's like, okay, like, let us build the first product and then let us build some products that then give you access to do similar things that we showed you you could do by building the Wayband. And so we see we see our approaches like a enabling people to like eventually like use our device, get an HDK for it, an SDK, and be able to like go in and design their own experiences, use it as a peripheral for anything that they want to explore, and to have more fine haptic control and experiences with. Because um, one of the biggest challenges is, is that uh, when you buy a cell phone, for example, like you're you're, you're, you have the haptics that are built into the device. And most cell phones, the haptic experience is not meant to be the major experience of the device. It's a, it's a very like sub sub system, you know? And so Optimize, we, we've, a lot of people have done a lot of great work in this space with haptics so far. Like, and it's been really awesome to kind of see what you can do, but it's still like, we're still here with it, you know? Like, and so we're like, okay, let's build a haptic device from scratch that gives you like, potential full haptic range so that you have much more space to play with. It's kind of like, you know, you know, you can go buy like the, you know, the Bluetooth, you know, speaker, you know, from like, you know, I don't know, from like the corner store for like $8 or you can like buy like a, a Bose sound link radio. And it's like the sound quality is going to be very, very different. And so we're hoping that we can build a high quality device that enables people to want to explore haptics for themselves. And, that's when the game really opens up.
Yeah, it's like VR that doesn't have enough frame rate. You just get sick. You've got to <laughs> you've got to have a decent experience there. Mm-hmm. So, so with this, how are you guys? How are you guys funding the business? How are you scaling this up with something that is so cash intensive? Kickstarter yeah. thoughts? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so we basically have gotten a lot of money through grants. Um, we've received the National Science Foundation grant, uh, FutureWorks, which is a, a company based out of uh, of based in new york um that does a lot of support for hardware entrepreneurs like in new york city um they gave us our first ten thousand dollars when we came in with a video and a seatbelt full of vibration motors that like we hot glued together the night before you know like um you know like the black and latino tech initiative at Rutgers university gave us about ten thousand dollars and so like we had these people who these programs where we were like oh hey here's an opportunity and they just saw what we were doing is like wow this probably won't work, but if it does, it is going to be amazing. Let's bet on those guys. And, and so like, we got a lot of grant money. And then of course, like we also have like, like investors, like friends and family round we did, and we have some institutional investors as well. Uh, we were part of urban X, which is an accelerator program based out of Brooklyn that focuses on like smart cities. And, uh, at the time the partners were SOSV, which is a venture capital firm that invests in the accelerator model. And then the other partner was mini Cooper, the car company. Um, And so we got a ridiculously robust network from like having like such a strong person in the VC space and then having such a well like consumer brand that's so well recognized and BMW owns Mini Cooper. So, you know, BMW has given us like wonderful access to like expertise and, you know, they just opened up the back doors for us and let us like run around and get anything that we need. So we've gotten a lot of support. Um, Plus like a, also to us, like, a, because we're so mission driven, like a lot of people just really want to help us, you know? And so like, we get like volunteers all the time who come in and it's like, Hey, I noticed that your website isn't really accessible. Let me help you with that. Um, or, you know, Hey, this project seems really, really interesting. I want to take these skills that I'm learning and like help people with them. And so we we're we're able to kind of create like an entire ecosystem of just openness to support, understanding that we don't know anything, that we don't know everything, and that when someone walks in with a willingness and a drive to really like help, to like make space for them to see what they can do, irregardless of what background they may have come from. You know, like like you have the you have the passion, you have the expertise, you have you have the passion, you have the interest, you have some expertise that we need, <laughs> of course. Um, but more is kind of like, you know, there's something about this thing that is driving you. And so we're able to leverage a lot of just goodwill from, from amazing people who have come on as advisors and mentors and supporters and volunteers and interns. So this is definitely like not something you do alone. Um, you know, it's a whole community that has, that has been like trying to get this way back out for the next four years. And as far as uh, uh, funding, we, we were definitely looking at Kickstarter. We're actually launching our Kickstarter campaign at the end of September. Um, so you're like the first person, like we told about it. <laughs> um, what are you, what are you going for? How much? Uh, what, do you, so what do you need to make it happen? Yeah. So the goal for the Kickstarter campaign is 50 K. Um, but we're really hoping to like, we, we really think that we're going to be able to blow this thing out the water and, and, and bring in somewhere closer to like 180. Um, that would be closer to ideal. Um, at, at a thousand units, you know, the cost drop dramatically and that gives us the ability to, a kind of like strongly validate um, our concept with all the people who have been supporting us, um, but also more it gives us it gives us the legs to stand on to go after like bigger money for for VC and, and institutional investors because right now we're we're pre revenue we're technically pre product even though we've done some amazing things with our product no one can buy it yet and so most most VC firms will fund market risk. They'll fund like, will this work in the marketplace? They won't fund technological risks. Um, and so you, you need to, and angels will, they'll fund technological risks. They're all about the mission and like, you know, having fun along the way. And of course, like if they can make money too, that's super duper great. Um, but you know, like we're kind of like in this in-between space. And so it's like, we're big enough that like lower end VCs can come on board and support us, um, especially mission driven VCs. Um, and innovation-based VCs, but then we're also like on this higher side for angels. And so where it's, it's, it's actually been a, 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 
uh, a huge a huge learning curve to understand like who we need to be going for because we spent last year we spent the whole summer going after like VC money and then basically after like three months of meetings and like all the analysis we realized like we're way too early stage for them to even be like considering us they basically all told you to do a Kickstarter yeah you know like they were just like it was it was it was it was, it was always like uh, okay come back when you have users and revenue you know like show us users show us revenue you know like and and, and that was and that's kind of like that defining moment where you kind of like okay you have this really really great idea and then like at that moment when you have users and revenue it becomes like a business and like in the middle you're just like trying not to die to get to the other side you know like literally <laughs> it's not that sounds about right it's a freaking roller coaster <laughs> So you lived in Japan for six months and you wanted to design a Kung Fu stew. There's a story there somewhere. What's the deal with Kung Fu in Japan? Yeah. Um, so I actually like, so I'm born and raised in Camden, New Jersey, uh, which is right outside of Philadelphia. You know, like uh, when I was growing up there, it was, you know, pretty bad. It's still pretty bad. You know, like we had, you know, the highest murder rate per capita for quite some time. We had, I think we were like the fifth poorest city at the time. And so it's like, you know, like, I come from this place of like, you know, like, you know, just poverty and lots of crime because when there's poverty, there's crime. And, you know, and so it's like, so I, I come from this place and, and, you know, and it's like, it's mainly black. Right. And, and so I've never met a Japanese person, but at six years old, I wanted to be a Japanese sword maker. And I was super clear on that, you know, and it, 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 it totally didn't make sense uh, to me at all, but it was just like, I just, I loved anime, I loved samurai movies, I love I love the portrayal of what I thought the culture was. And so I, I got into martial arts, you know, like mainly because of that portrayal of Asia in general. It was very specific to Japan, but in Asia in general, I just had this like deep interest. And I, I found a guy who taught martial, who taught Kung Fu and agreed to teach me. And so I just like, learned with him for a while and then after that i kind of like i never mastered any martial art um i would like do this for a few years and then like do this for a few years and then like do that for a few years but i ended up doing like kendo i ended up doing ninjutsu um the last martial art i was practicing was kudo which is japanese traditional longbow archery um and at some point i so i also went to school a lot which i don't highly recommend but sometimes going to school is just the fastest way to learn what you need you know um, I'm not necessarily like a degree person, but I have three of them, right? And so, um, so after I did engineering school, I went to fashion school. And while I was in fashion school, my first collection I designed was based off of Japanese lanterns. And now I'm, now I'm like 27. I'm like, this is ridiculous, Keith. Like, you know what? I'm going to take an East Asian literature course to prove to myself that this is like, you know, BS, right? And I walk into this class and two weeks in i was like holy crap i need to live in japan for at least six months of my life fast forward i ended up going to pratt and we walk in you know and I, I think it was like the first week or so they was like hey we just invented this brand new program called global innovation design and guess what you guys get to be the first people to try it out so if you do it you'll spend six months studying design in tokyo and four months studying at the royal college of art and imperial college in london so we were at Keio university and I just heard six months in Japan, and I was like, wow, how often does the thing that you ask for exactly show up? So to me, it was like the minute they said spend six months in Japan, I was a like, yes. Everything else was just like, we'll figure it out on the back end. And so, um, so I went to Japan, and when I got there, you know, I mean, I mean, I went there for school, of course. And but like the, the real reason I went to Japan was because like I went to go meet a Japanese sword maker, because I'm like, finally. I'm going to be a Japanese sword maker. I'm going to make this happen somehow, right? And, you know, total, total just like, I don't know. I don't know what, what I'd be thinking sometimes when, when I, like, start on paths. But it usually it doesn't make any sense, which is really great, because if it made any sense, I don't think any of these paths I would start on. So that's fantastic. Um, but I ended up getting... Japanese? Koshi, you know, not so much anymore. I've, I've been out of Japan for about four or five years, but... Um, I was, I was, I could get by when I was there, you know, like barely get by as long as we had a very narrow subject matter. How are you? I'm doing great. You know? Um, but so when I was there, I, the first thing I did was I land next day, I go to the sword museum 
And then I found an antique sword dealer and I walk in, I was like, I need the list of every sword maker in Japan. You know, I thought it was like seven, but it was like 300. So he was like, okay, I'll give you the top 10 in Tokyo. And these two guys speak English. And I'm like, okay, cool, bet. You know? And so I actually had that phone number in my pocket for whew, like four months. Like I got the phone number in September. I was about to leave Tokyo in January and I hadn't called the guy yet. And I, I, was, I was in this really weird dilemma where I was kind of like, what happens if he says no, which he probably will, right? You know, like, then my six-year-old dream, like, is dead, right? And then I'm like, what if he says yes? Then I'm like, then I've, I've, I've done the whole, I've done the thing I've dreamed about my whole life. Like, what else is there to live for? You know, like, and ultimately, through that four months of deliberation, I realized that like, oh, wow, like, when you like, when you like, you know, when you, when you accomplish your dreams, you just, you just make new ones. And I don't know why that was so hard. I mean, in my mind before, I guess it was like, you were built with a dream and that was the thing that you held on to until you accomplished it. And then like you expired because like life no longer needed you. And I'm just like, oh wait, no, you just, you just make a new dream. And so um, I met him and he was amazing. It turns out he was like, he's a uh, uh, Yoshiwara Sama. As I, he, it apparently out he's like one of the greatest sword makers living. I had no idea. I just like called the first person that was on the list. Um, and, uh, and it also turns out that like becoming a sword maker is like eight years of like apprenticeship, which is like the same time I could be like a doctor and a lawyer, <laughs> you know, like, so I was like, okay, you know what? Maybe if I figured this out when I was 20, I would do it. And if I had space to do it when I was 50, I would do it. But at the time I was 32 and I was like, these are going to be the most productive years of my life. And I, I, I just think that I have more responsibility to the world than indulging my own pleasure by like banging on metal and making the most beautiful swords in the world. And so, you know, I mean, of course, like who's to say that I would even like be accepted. I didn't, I'm not Japanese, obviously, you know, like, so there, there's that whole part of it, but like more, it was kind of like, okay, like this isn't, this isn't the best use of like this energy that I have left. Like, like I'm old enough to like know better, but I'm young enough to like not sleep for nights on end. Like, I'm like, this is a prime period of my life. Like, I really need to turn this into something meaningful and useful that I feel is actually a contribution, you know, to the world. And so I, I was like, okay, sword making on pause. Let's figure something else out. Why do you want to do something meaningful? Where'd that come from? Uh, you know, uh, so like, I always kind of felt like my life was like a, a tick and a clock, you know, like I, I had like a, you know, like growing up in Camden, like, you know, people die all the time and, you know, they die really young and pretty tragically. And, 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 and so you, you start to internalize that you're probably not going to live long. Like I celebrated on my 25th birthday because the statistic was, is that like as a black man in Camden, like from 15 to 25, like you're either going to be like locked up or like killed. And so my 25th, birthday was like a celebration for me, you know, like, and so like, I want to do something meaningful because I, I just felt like I went through a lot of like pain and, 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 and BS in, in life, like, like kind of like, because of like the place that I happened to like, you know, be born in to, you know, like all of a sudden my whole world was confined and was restricted. And, you know, there was very little, access to 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 get out of it you know like and you know it's like and, and you know camden camden for me was like that and i think there are lots of other places like that where they're, they're just kind of like they're almost like black holes where it's like once you're in there's it's really really like you have to you have to be like ridiculously exceptional to kind of like pull away and get out and and i don't know i, I mean it, it one i mean i personally i don't think that's fair right you know like but then also too it's like it's like there are lots of like my friends who won't have the privilege to stand in the space that I have been allowed to stand in. And, and granted, I had a lot of focus along the way. Like I made a lot of sacrifices along the way, but like a lot of those friends made sacrifices to keep me out of trouble. You know, like, like they, they paid the part in their own way. And in my mind, I was like, if you're just going to like go through all this pain in life and then die, then there's no reason to go through life like just cut the pain short and like die now. Right. And you know, like, I, so like 
that was like, I, I was always very logical, a, a bit emotionally detached, but I always kind of looked at things. It's like, why, why do I want to give myself 40 more years of this pain only to die? And, and so I came up with this expression that like life is a bunch of pain and bullshit and you die. Right. And then like 15 years later, like <laughs> I realized that like, oh, unless you make it mean something more than what it is. And so I was like, wait, so I made a new definition for myself. And I was like, you know what? If I can help one person out, then I'll deem all the pain that I went through as worth it because there was at least someone who got the benefit from all that stuff that I had to go through, right? And then I, had, I ended up helping one person out and that was amazing. And I was like, wait, but if I help two people out, then I get way more efficiency on the pain that I have already put in and paid. And then I was like, if you change the whole world, your pain is basically negligible. And so a huge part of like impact was, was, I mean, like, you know, like selfishly it was justifying my own pain. Um, but even more so it was kind of like, wow, like there's a really huge opportunity here to actually leave the world in a better place than I got it to like, to, cause like when I was growing up, like I, I had someone straight up tell me that like, oh, I was probably going to end up in prison. Like one of my teachers, you know, like, and I was a pretty good student. I, I graduated top 20 in my class. And I also did never did any homework because the school system was rigged in a weird way. Right. And so it was like, it was like, be smart enough to get out, but like not so smart that you like stand out because then you might not make it out, you know, like, and so anyway, all of this was really around like, just wanting to feel like all the stuff that I went through was for a reason. And if I can look back and be like, wow, because I went through this, like all these people are now able to do that. then that's a win for me. You got the chip on your shoulder. You were forged in fire. <laughs> you you, you kind of got your sword maker deal, except you were the sword. You just didn't realize that at the time. Ooh, uh, I love it. Oh my God. I'm going to use that on my bio. Sorry. Go, go for it. <laughs> I, feel that. I might have to steal your quote. It was, very, it was very deep and stoic. How do other people that are in shit situations struggle to get out of them? Do you have any pieces of advice for people? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, like there is that whole like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, like, but some people don't have boots, you know, like, like literally, like, I remember like, like us having to go and like, ask a next door neighbor for like ketchup and bread and sugar, you know, like, like we were that kind of poor, like in the middle of the month after our food stamps ran out. So, you know, like, you know, like the, the, I, I guess the, the, the best place to start is like to, to you got to start with something that you really think is like worth going through hell for. You know, like, and I don't know if, 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 if you figured out, maybe, you know, you don't give them figured out what that thing is yet exactly, but like there has to be, because inertia is going to pull you to the center of the black hole. That if you do nothing, you're going to go down. And like, that's the way the system is rigged. Like that's the way it's set up, like in those particular spaces. If you do absolutely nothing, you're just going to whirl around into the whirlpool and eventually you're going to get swallowed. And so it's like, you got to, you got you to gotta have something that is worth paddling for. And you have, to have, you, have to, you have to have something that's big enough or at least that's meaningful enough to you that gives you some hope that you might actually, able be, able to, you might actually be able to paddle out of this thing. Because you could want what's on the other side of the event horizon and get out of the black hole, right? But like, if you don't really believe you can do it, like, you can't. And, and especially if you're in a situation where you have like such high gravity pulling you down or pulling you into something that is like not the experience that you want to have. And so I guess like the, the, the best advice I can give is, is to, to find that thing that you love, to, 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 to find a way to believe in it that's, that goes beyond what you're capable of and to, to, to talk about what you believe in and to, to, let people help you you know like like i was 15 years old and i had an internship in an engineering firm you know like because at 12 years old i knew i wanted to be an engineer um you know like and there was some flawed logic to that um you know at the time like but at the end of the day it was like you know like i had met some people who had knew some people 
who was willing to just like hire me as an intern and like do some office work. And then as I worked there more and more, I got to do bigger and bigger jobs. Right. And so it wasn't glamorous. It wasn't necessarily fun, but it was like, I could, I could easily see how the step that I was taking put me one step closer to where I was going than where I was before. And that was all that was important. You know, like when I left engineering and I decided like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to like do something in fashion because I was an artist and then I wanted to do useful art because engineering was useful and art and useful to me was fashion. Right. And you know, like, and I'm telling my grandmother after like struggling for six years to get my engineering degree and like, you know, failing out after my first semester with a, like a, a 0 0.67 GPA after finally graduating six months in, I'm like, you know what, grandma, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to go be a shoemaker. You know, like she was, you know, it was like, it was that battle, that struggle, that uphill. And so I'm like, I'm not looking for engineering jobs anymore. I'm going to go work at Nordstrom because working at Nordstrom is closer to fashion than working at engineering, which is what I was doing. You know, like, and so like for three years, me and my grandma would have these conversations with her trying to get me an engineering job still. And, you know, like funny thing is I ended up becoming a coach. I, I ended up becoming a handbag engineering coach. And so like, when the coach bag started rolling in for Christmas, you know, like everyone was like, Oh, we get it now. And, 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 and it, you want it, to bring us one of those bags? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, but I, I think the main thing to, to kind of keep in and to keep in mind is, is that like the people around you, they really do love you and they think they're supporting you by telling you what you shouldn't do because maybe they have some experience where things didn't work out so great for them and they regretted it. But like, you have to have an understanding like but they're not living your life only you really understand where it is that you're going and and like you have to hold that internally with with you know like be open of course to finding better ways to get to where you want to go be open to questioning whether this is the place you should even go in the first place if there's any value in going there or you know like when i was making i wanted to be a shoemaker Midway through the program, I, I walk into FIT, like my, 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 my entrance letter is, I'm gonna be the greatest shoemaker the world has ever seen. Like that, that's what I opened with, like, <laughs> like. And then like halfway through the program, I'm like, I don't really like shoes. I really like handbags more. And I had this existential dilemma where it's like, am I quitting or am I moving on? You know, like, and then I was like, yo, you know what? Honestly, it, I, nothing in my heart, nothing would have ever brought me to handbag design. Like nothing. Like, so shoes was the gateway that I needed to get to handbag design, right? So like you're driving down the highway, like you just need to see the next 300 feet in front of you, like, and know that the road is taking you to Florida eventually, right? And so like every part of the process is like an unveiling that like shows itself to you. And if you stay true to like your internal compass of like what really feels right to you, even when you... Even, even when what feels right to you goes against what you used to say felt right to you in the past. You know, it's like being able to like shed that, like, okay, yes, I did want to be the greatest shooter maker. That was a really important part of my story because that got me here to handbags. And now this is what I'm doing. And be, you know, like, but like to not feel like, I didn't feel any sense of betrayal. I didn't feel like I was betraying my purpose. I felt like I was evolving and that more things were coming into my awareness and now I had better vision, you know? And so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I guess to, to wrap it all up, like believe in something that's bigger than you, um, really believe in you, believe that you have what it takes to not do it now, but be able to figure it out eventually or to be able to find the people that can help you figure it out, which is all you really, really need. And surround yourself with, people who, who can help share your dreams. I think a lot of people keep their dreams inside because they're, they're afraid of what people might think of them. It's like, like you with the sword maker. No, you know, like when I was in, in, in second grade, they said, Hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? I was like, I want to be a blacksmith, but I also happen to be like the blackest person in the class. So like all, all the kids laugh. Right. And it was funny. Right. You know, like now it's funny, but you know, like <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, but even beyond people laughing at you, I think that a lot of times people are afraid that like someone's going to take their idea or that like someone is going to like beat them to the punch. And, you know, the, the thing is, is that like, if no one knows what you're doing, no one can help you do it. And you can't do anything by yourself. Like that is a fallacy. 
that you need to get out of your head immediately. There, there, literally, there is nothing you can do alone. Like you're only alive because your parents fed you. Like dependency is, or codependency at least is like is like part of our design in a way. You know, like so it's like if you're not sharing your dream with people, you're not giving them the space to actually help you out. And you know, like I was at a conference one time and, and, and they asked and it was like, how many people like helping people? 97% of the people raised their hand. And it's like, how many people like being helped? 5% of the population raises their hand. And then they said, it's like, you know what? You know the easiest way that you can allow someone to contribute to your life is just simply to just accept their help. And I was like, wow, all this time, all these people were trying to help me and they saw something greater in me and they wanted to contribute to that in some small way, $20 for food, you know, a Metro pass, an introduction to somebody, you know, some help with some admin stuff. Right. And I blew it off because I'm like, no, I don't need your help. Right. I'm, I'm strong, like forged and fire. Right. I'm strong. I don't need your help. Like that independence, like I'm strong. And it's like, all that help that I pushed away that could have like, who knows, it could have gotten me here in half the time had I understood that idea before. It's like, let people help you. But like, you have to be transparent, you have to be authentic. And what you're doing has to be meaningful enough to you so that when you share it with someone else, they, they feel the meaning in it. And if you can't do that, like, you know, you're not gonna be able to convince anyone to come on your side. And, and if you can't do that, then you almost can't do anything. If you got a dream, it requires a team. And if it doesn't require a dream, a team, you're not dreaming big enough. I think you have a, might have a career as a motivational speaker. Once you build this into an epic company and <laughs> change the world, it's, um, it really yeah. is. It really is an inspirational story. And you also, well, let's face it. You wouldn't have been able to get into handbags if you were coming out of Camden, cause you would have had plenty of trouble just with people bullying you about getting into handbags, even though it turned out to be an incredibly successful way to get into what you're doing now. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, yeah. Let's jump to the bonus round. Listeners, if you haven't supported us, disruptors.fm slash Patreon, we have some epic questions with some of our awesome guests, and that's a way for us to make this more sustainable so we can keep bringing disruptors to you guys. First question for you. I want to play God. Let's jump back to the interview <laughs> now. What do you think about all the wearables people are wearing and data privacy and safety? You know, data privacy is a super duper big challenge, especially here in the United States because, you know, like we've, been so negligent of it and you know like negligent as cons negligent as you know like corporations and, and companies because you know like the data gives us value and so the more data and control we have over that data the more value we can create for ourselves which is kind of in our bottom line our fiduciary responsibilities right but but then on the other end from the consumer side too it's like like, you know how many credit cards I signed up for, for free t-shirts or like Reese cups? Cause I was like a broke college student, you know, like, and you know, like I can trace, I can trace my challenges, like my early challenges with debt to like wanting that t-shirt, you know, like, and I feel like that's what we proverbially do. We want the t-shirt and we sign away all of our rights and all of our data. And I think that like, my, 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 my biggest thing now, and like, you know, and like what I like and where I see us going as far as like data and privacy protection, especially like we work with blind people, data is super duper sensitive, you know, like, is that like the data that is generated by you living your life should be owned by you. Like bar none, same way, like if I write a song, it's already owned by me, you know, like we already have that in intellectual properties protection, like anything that I generate being alive should be on like this conversation should be on by us. Right. And then we can decide together that, Hey, I'm comfortable with you doing this with this data, you know, like broadcasting it to your viewers. Right. And, and I think right now what happens is, is that like companies collect data and then make money off of the data, but the user kind of like, Theoretically speaking, they get the experience that is worth them giving their data away for free for. But I think that a new business model might be coming where people actually pay for their data. And that might be a way to subsidize, you know, like all the outsourcing that's going to occur when machines can basically do everything that we can do. 
Yeah, it is. It is an interesting paradigm shift coming in a lot of ways. The advertising model has caused a lot of the problems, but people don't want to pay for content. Mm -hmm. It creates one. You get granular enough with the advertising. It's kind of like a takeoff. When you have something exponential, it kind of builds and builds and builds. But once you reach that takeoff, suddenly you can reach the point of no return where something goes from being benign to being malignant very quickly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and, and the thing is, is like, like, you know, like good versus evil, you know, like there's no good or evil. There's just, it's just incentives. Exactly. Incentives and intentions, you know, like, and so we really need to pay attention to, cause like literally like you get what you pay for, you know, like, and I used to think back in the day that that meant like, Oh, if you pay little, you get little quality. But it's like the thing that you're incentivizing, the thing that you're paying for is the thing that you're going to get. If I incentivize all of my employees to do their job as fast as possible, like we would have lots of jobs being done fast, but like, how would the quality be? Like, you know, like if, if there's no incentives that are equally beneficial for quality, well then it might be easier to pay to fine than to lose the bonus. Right? So, we really need to like pay attention to like, and we can like, as, as business people, as technologists, as we can craft these societies that we want by developing those rules and those understandings in the entities that we're personally building, you know, like, like at where works, for example, like, you know, I love being able to be wherever. I don't really see the, the point of necessarily having to be tied to a space for a period of time. You and because you know, you're private though. I think the core, I think public markets almost distort that too much. So let's say you guys are incredibly successful. You IPO, yay, Morgan Stanley gets to have their champagne. Well, eventually it comes to the point where you've got your board of directors and they're like, well, you know what? He could have shot his, I mean, let's take it as far as we can go. He could have shot his employee in the head and cut his costs. We should have done that. Well, you know what? We're firing him because he didn't reduce overhead by 50%, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. And, and that is a super duper huge thing that we need to pay attention to. Like, because like right now is like the IPO is the model that we're, we're pushing. Like, and the other thing is, is that like the, the, the public sector, you know, like has shown a tendency to be, or at least has shown the potential to be extremely like short-sighted when like looking at like what their incentives are for the next quarter, right? And so it's like, we need to like, we need to build in as consumers, as the people who are supporting the companies, like we need to build in that this is the types of brands that we wanna have by showing and voting with our dollars that, hey, people who take a longer vision, you know, like it, it, it you know, like, and, and, and like Bose is one of my favorite companies, you know, like, uh, for that reason. And, uh, uh, Amir, Amir Bose or Zamar, I'm sorry, sorry, Bose, if I totally hammered his name wrong, but, um, you know, like the, the founder of Bose basically was like, you know, like, uh, I think, uh, there was a story that was like his president walked in at one point because apparently he had come up with this idea for like noise canceling headphones and it took like 15 years and $50 million to develop and, you know, and I think the, the person who was running the company, the president at the time, maybe, or maybe he was the CEO, I'm not sure what their roles were, but he walks in and he's like, hey, you know, we spent $50 million developing noise canceling. He was like, wow, $50 million. He was like, if this was a public company, I would have been fired years ago. You know, like, and, and, and for me, it's kind of like, you have to understand that as a founder, like, what are you really trying to build? You know, like, if, if your goal is to like get to a billion dollars as, 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 as quick and as fast as you can and like, well, you know, you understand what's likely going to happen as a result of that, like things are going to shift and you're going to get to a space where like you're being evaluated based off of quarters. But I think it's also like there are a lot of companies that are like taking a really, really long view. And I think that that is going to be something that is also going to be eventually become the norm as well, where companies are more rewarded for taking a longer vision more rewarded by the actual market than the short-term gains. I sure hope so. You need to have VC funds with longer time structures to make it work. <laughs> this, is, this is something I've thought and talked about a bit as well. Is it, It's tough when you have a 10-year time horizon to, exactly. to make your returns. And, or, or at least like, you know, deeply variable, you know, like exit strategy options instead of like... Two. You're getting married to this girl or you're shooting, you're blowing your head off. Sorry. You got two options. <laughs> and do you know what? You're going to love her. So, so Keith, I got one, I got one last question for you before you tell people 
where to find you, where they can check you out, and how they can start running with their eyes closed in case they're blind. <laughs> so, or they're not blind. Sorry, that came out wrong. <laughs> if you're not, if you're not blind and you want to go running with your eyes closed, this is the perfect product for you. And if you want to, if you want to change the way you experience the world, they're working on that too. So, my last question for you is: What is the question I should have asked that I didn't? Mm, wow, that's a that's a really hard man. This this is that's, that's, that's tough. Let's see, what should you have asked that you didn't? Um, let me think about this for one split second. Um, you asked a lot of really good questions. I think that the question that I would ask, I'm totally going to like Hopefully, I'm just gonna like talk, and hopefully, that comes out of my mouth by the time the question gets to the like the time frame. But um, I think the 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 question that oh, here we go. I got a good one. Okay, like why am I so obsessed with touch? That might have been a good question to ask. Why are you obsessed with touch? <laughs> so. Also, like this is, I thought, man, this is like this is starting so personal, right? And so, um, so like I, I remember like when I was younger, you know, like I kind of like separated myself from emotions because I, I thought that they were like, they basically like walked into the party and like ruined the party for everybody. I'm like, let's get these things out of here because like they're always messing things up. And so I took a pretty kind of like stoic and like really logical view on life as a generality. Um, and so I, I wasn't really necessarily the best communicator you know, growing up and, uh, I would be in intimate relationships and I would be with my partners and they would be like, they would be trying to get me to communicate better. And I was being resistant. And I was like, well, why can't you just like, like, why can't you just understand how I touch you? Like, it's really clear. And for me, it was like, the funny thing about that statement for me was that like, it, it was super clear for me. It's like, if, if a person touches me, I really do genuinely feel that like I get a lot of information from that experience. And so like, if you're saying everything is fine, but the way I, the way you touch me is not, it, it feels off and, and they're like, hey, what's really going on? Like, you can talk to me about it. You're like, so it's like, to me, I was, I was actually using the sense of touch personally, like in my personal relationship as a means of communication, like here's how I feel about you. I'm touching you intentionally in this particular kind of way. You know, like it was, it was, it was by design and so it's just really funny because, you know, like I never would have thought that I would be designing touch. Like that is like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a mind blow that like this is even, that designing touch is even possible, let alone like, you know, a, a, an inevitable future at this point. Um, so yeah, like the, the, this whole space of haptics to me just feels so natural because it's like, it's, felt like, it's, it's how I feel like I've been communicating my whole life. Then it all comes full circle. We had the sex <laughs> robots and we've yes. had a lot of fun. Where is the best place for people to find you, Keith, and figure out what you're doing and if they want to help with your awesome mission to help? Yeah, so you can go to www.where.works, W-E-A-R dot W-O-R-K-S. Um, and you can find everything that we've done with the Wayband there. We've actually just totally redesigned the site. Um, we're actually, we're also launching the Kickstarter campaign in September. And so we would love your yeah, support for that. Um, we're going to do a super duper ridiculous early bird special price. And we're going to take down, we're going to take $10 down payments on our website uh, to reserve your slot for that spot. And, and then all those group of people will get the announcement before we announce to the public that uh, the Kickstarter is going to go active. Cause we, you know, like uh, uh, for us, like uh, in particular, like the, um, especially in the space of like the blind and low vision community, there's like huge income disparities and challenges. There's huge unemployment challenges. And we really want to give our, our, our early supporters like who've been with us for years, for two months even, for two weeks, that, that have been like really supporting us and helping us build this thing out, believing in us the best price that we can. And so we're going to be doing that. You can also find us on Instagram at, you know, where.works as well pre-order guys it helps them boost the kickstarter rankings if you guys find this interesting if you find what they're doing awesome and you would buy the product anyways go do it where that works we've got links and everything in the show notes thanks for coming today keith
Thanks so much for having me. It was a blast. Yeah, it's been a fun one, personal, <laughs> in inspirational, definitely. Oh and my god, I, I'm gonna love man, it. I'm like, I'm like, I hope my co-founders are like, yo, dude, what the heck? <laughs> I got this sense of touch, right? I'll talk to you later, man. Yeah. This was fun. Ciao. See you guys. <laughs>